As he kicked off the 1970s, Price found himself attached once again to the work of Edgar Allan Poe in the made-for-TV special An Evening of Edgar Allan Poe, which debuted on January 1st, 1970. This was an hour-long special consisting of a collection of four Poe tales, The Telltale Heart, Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? <laughs> the Pit and the Pendulum. I was sick. Sick unto death with that long agony. I felt that my senses were leaving me. The dread sentence of death was the last distinct phrase which reached my ears. The Sphinx. I was not so fortunate, and the palsying fears of evil and death had taken possession of my soul. My state of mind had been well primed for the terrifying incident which soon took place. In the cask of Amontillado. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. Rather than a static reading of the stories, Price acted out each tale on custom design sets with period costumes designed by his wife, Mary. The show was directed by Kenneth Johnson for AIP TV and was filmed before a live audience. Beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied my manner had convinced them I was singularly at ease. This is one of my very favorite Vincent Price films. It gave him a chance to show off his years of theatrical experience. When asked about this, Price said it's probably the best Poe thing that I ever did. And I personally have to agree. Then a noise attracted my notice and looking to the floor, I saw several enormous rats. They had issued from the pit with ravenous eyes allured by the scent of the meat. Vincent's first feature film of the 1970s was one of the more bizarre of his entire career, Scream and Scream Again. The plot of this one is a bit of a mess. It concerns several separate stories that incoherently intertwine towards the end of the film. We open on a jogger who collapses while on a morning run and wakes to find himself in a hospital. He learns to his shock and horror that his leg has been amputated. We cut back to him several times throughout the film to find that he has had more appendages removed each time. There is also a psycho sex killer called the Vampire Killer running loose in the streets of London, raping and killing women as well as draining their blood. The police, led by Detective Belliver, played by Alfred Marks, are tracking down the killer, played by Michael Gothard. When they finally confront him, they find that he has superhuman strength. They manage to subdue him and chain him to the back of a squad car bumper with a pair of handcuffs. But he escapes by ripping off his arm above the wrist. Get off! We have some animal photos, will you? Right, sir. Royce, use the car, head him up. The police chase him to the home of Dr. Browning, played by Vincent Price, where he commits suicide by jumping into a vat of acid. <clears throat> the police question Dr. Browning and learn that one of the vampire killer's victims actually worked for the doctor. They take the severed hand back to the police station and discover that it is not human and, in fact, is made up of synthetic materials. The third storyline has very little to do with the other two and concerns a strange European totalitarian country with a Nazi-like police force. A member of this police state named Conrads, played by Marshall Jones, is murdering people by crushing their shoulders in a super strong death grip that makes the Vulcan neck pinch from Star Trek look like a day at the spa. The 
three stories all come together when we learn that the vampire killer and the shoulder crusher are both part of a race of android beings created by Dr. Browning. Composites, as he calls them, sewn together Frankenstein style from the body parts of captured victims and enhanced in Browning's lab. We also learn that Browning himself is a composite. In a twist, it is revealed that Christopher Lee, as a British Secret Service agent named Fremont, is secretly he working with the totalitarian government and trying to cover the entire that thing up be corrupted as mankind too much power. isn't ready to accept so we must find all of the others who may Scream and Scream Again was directed by Gordon Hessler, who had directed Price in the Oblong Box just months earlier. This film is notable in that it's the first teaming of three horror legends together, Vincent Price, Peter Cushing, and Christopher Lee. Although, to be fair, it isn't much of a teaming as Cushing was brought in at the last minute to perform a pointless cameo for the totalitarian state segment. He is given little to do and killed off quickly without sharing screen time with either of the other horror stars. Price and Lee do share one scene when Christopher Lee kills Price seemingly through sheer force of will alone. Apparently channeling his old friend Count Dracula, Lee stares ominously at Price and slowly advances on him, forcing him to fall backwards into a vat of acid. The screenplay was written by Christopher Wicking and based on a novel called The Disoriented Man by Peter Saxon, which is actually a pseudonym for several British writers. In the novel, it's revealed that the entire scheme is brought about by aliens, but that plot element was discarded for the film. It's appropriate that the source novel for this film is called The Disoriented Man, as this film is a disoriented, disjointed mess. The three various plot elements never quite mesh, and the film is all but incoherent. That said, Price as a Frankenstein-style doctor putting together his composites is a must-see for Vincent fans. My advice, just roll with it for what it is and enjoy the film. It's actually pretty fun. Next up, Price will be reunited with director Hessler one final time in the film Cry of the Banshee. I don't have much of a chance to show off. And, well, I couldn't resist telling you anyway. from Nikon. It puts great photography at everybody's fingers.